Hi class, uh, welcome to the second part of lecture today. So uh, we've been talking about what it means to try and define the word life. And so we're using Earth as an example. So we're gonna look at all the life we can find on that planet back there and see if we can look at common features among all those life forms to try and decide what it is that in our heads we recognize when we say the word life, okay? So what we talked about last time was uh, we introduced the idea of taxonomy, okay? And so we'll talk about that a little bit now and then we'll talk about it some more uh, next lecture uh, because we use that to define uh, life uh, 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 whenever we start categorizing it. Okay, so today let's try and get at an actual definition uh, that we're going to start with uh, for the definition of life. Okay, so we'll start with some of these attempts at taxonomy. We'll talk about uh, uh, ways we could approach looking at the life and sorting it into behaviors and categories and properties and see if it works for us. Um, and then we're going to define kind of six basic categories of things that we think you have to have in order to be identified as a life, okay? And we'll talk about the conditions for that. We'll talk about sufficiency and uh, whether or not it's required, okay? Uh, and then uh, I'll leave you at the end with a question to uh, bend your brain about and think about as we go along. So let's start by talking about taxonomy. So this is a group of three creatures I picked. They're all clearly animals. And if we were following along with what we talked about during the last part of the lecture, uh, we would be trying to categorize them into common groups with common properties. And then maybe those properties would help us um, identify life at all. Okay, so these are clearly animals. We all know what animals are, but if I look at all of them, I might try and deduce whether or not there are some properties that would help me uh, decide what they are, okay? So if I look at all of these animals, they each have five bodily projections. They have two feet of some sort, two arms of some sort, and a head, okay? Now, you might look at these three creatures and say, well, they also have a sixth one, right? They have a tail, don't they? Well, yeah, they do have tails, but if you look at the structure of their bodies, just like if you look at the structure of ours, those tails are a continuation of the vertebrae in the animal in this case. So, um, you know, that's the sort of nuance and sort of detail that uh, you as a taxonomist and your taxonomy friends would have to argue about and decide about if you were trying to categorize, okay? And there are many things we consider when we categorize animals. We're just trying to illustrate here what the, what the issues might be when you approach this, okay? Um, another feature among these three that you might uh, notice is they all have eyes, they all have mouths, and they all have ears of some sort, okay? So, you know, we can go through and do whatever uh, uh, suits us. We could spend great, great length of time arguing or uh, uh, listing what the properties of these creatures might be, uh, but let's start with these, okay? So, is that enough for me to go out into the world and look at other animals and correctly identify them as animals based on these criteria. Well, let's look at one, okay? Well, this is clearly an animal, okay? But it is not like any of those animals that uh, I showed above. It's not like the chipmunk, the mallard, or the iguana, okay? So this is a yellow perch. It mm, maybe has five bodily projections. It clearly has a head end. It has uh, enough fins that I might count them as the bodily projections, but it has uh, extra fins on top. What's that all about, okay? And again, the tail argument that we made last time is maybe okay because it, it fits in with the tail argument that we made uh, based on the spine of the animals above, okay? So maybe the perch works, maybe the perch doesn't, okay? Well, what about this, okay? Well, this is an octopus, a cephalopod, right? So an octopus clearly doesn't have five bodily projections. It has eight plus its head, okay? So nine in this case. Um, so that's clearly different than all of those animals. And so if I was using that bodily projection number as a counter, uh, it would clearly not work for this particular organism, even though you and I probably both agree that an octopus is an animal. Um, it does have eyes, it does have ears, and it does have a mouth hiding down there among his uh, uh, tentacles, okay? 
And what about this creature? Okay, so this is a C star. Okay, well, a C star clearly has five projections, or this particular C star does, but it fails uh, if I identify those the way we did with the others. There's no clear head on there. Um, there are no clear uh, uh, distinction between the five bodily projections, uh, but there's no clear eyes, uh, and there are no clear ears. Uh, there, it turns out there is a mouth, but it's on the underside of the C star in this picture. Okay, so it's not clear that this uh, definition of animal that you and I started with up there at the beginning is enough to clearly identify these. But uh, traditionally, animals has been one of the groups that we have divided uh, taxonomically all the life forms of Earth into. Uh, and so uh, whatever definition we originally settled on, uh, it would normally encompass all of these. And this kind of simple definition that you and I came up with here is not, uh, is not good enough, okay? So what I would say about this exercise is that our classification didn't fail, right? These are all clearly animals and we know they're animals and they all obey part of that definition to some extent. Okay, what we're seeing here is that our definitions have to be sophisticated. Okay, so the, the sophistication of the definition I made, five bodily projections, eyes, nose, uh, eyes, eyes, mouth, ears, was not sophisticated enough to clearly identify every animal that we uh, started with. Okay, the other point here is that you and I, if we were starting from scratch to classify all the animals we might encounter or be able to find, we know of far more animal species than were known at the time the taxonomical classification started. People may not have known about specific kinds of starfish or, you know, who knows what. Um, and so the point is, is that as time goes on and we collect better data, in this case, more observations of more life forms, then our taxonomy has to evolve and develop with it. And indeed, taxonomical classification changes over time. It's very different today than it was when I was a freshman in college. And so uh, even over very short time scales, the, the, what our understanding of the so-called tree of life, of the categorization of life, um, changes. Okay, so let's do the same exercise for a minute with plants. Okay, so here are uh, three clear, uh, clear plants. Okay, uh, a couple of different trees and a wild rose bush there. Okay, if I were to look at these, I might, in the similar way we did with the animals, try and develop a taxonomical classification. I might say they have branching structures that go from big structures into small structures. Okay, I might say they're rooty. Uh, rooty they're woody and they have roots and they have leaves, okay? So that seems eminently logical based on those three examples that I have there, but you know what's coming, right? There are clearly examples that fail that taxonomical classification, okay? And the most prominent being, well, here's some grass, okay? So first of all, grass isn't woody, at least most grasses aren't, uh, and it certainly doesn't have branching structure, not certainly the way trees do. Some grasses have multiple leaves and stems that come out, but many grasses do not, okay? Uh, but they do have roots, and uh, the whole blade of grass is clearly a leaf, okay? What about this stuff, right? This is moss, okay? So moss definitely doesn't have a branching structure. Well, some mosses don't. Uh, it's definitely not woody. Uh, it does have roots and leaves, yeah. Well, I don't know what you call those little things when you look at moss under a magnifying glass, okay? But it's definitely not leaves like the tree has up there. Okay, now at this point, if you've been staring at those pictures, uh, since I just pointed at the tree, it made me think of this, I should have said it a minute ago. If you go back to uh, our middle tree there, that's a pine tree. Okay, and so we were already playing fast and loose with our uh, uh, definitions of plants because those two things, a oak tree on the left and the pine tree in the center there, are clearly different sorts of plants. And we completely bypass the fact that they are very distinguishable from each other, uh, just based on the fact that one has leaves and one has needles. And then similarly, that rose bush uh, has flowers, and neither the pine tree nor the oak uh, has flowers like that rose bush does, okay? So when you start in classification games, like we're doing now, um, it's all completely based, like it, with the candy example we did in the last part of the lecture, it's all completely based on the criteria that you put on the table and the criteria you decide are important when you start classifying. And so in the classification that I wrote there, structure, wood, root, leaves, um, you know, I ignored the fact that there were flowers or I ignored the fact that uh, uh, needles weren't the same thing as leaves. 
Okay. Okay. So anyway, so back to the last example then. The last example here is algae. Okay. And so algae is very different than any of the plants that you have here. It, uh, it's green. It's, uh, you know, it does things that plants do, but it's not clear that it's a plant of the same structure as these. Okay. So, so this kind of physical classification, okay, physical taxonomy is maybe not the best thing for us because it's very complicated because there's a lot of variety in the different sorts of life that we uh, encounter and the different sorts of life that we see, okay? So it might be uh, interesting to consider whether or not we could classify life based on things it does, okay? So I've listed here the two broad uh, life classifications that we grow up learning. There's plants, and there's animals, okay, using our oak tree and our chipmunk as our representatives of those things. So let's see if we can classify life based on things life does, okay? Well, let's imagine movement, okay? Well, the chipmunk clearly moves, okay? Um, scurries around, runs away from me, steals stuff out of my bird feeder, the whole nine yards, okay? What about the tree? Well, the tree, I'm gonna give a yellow check because depending on how you think about movement, uh, you may or may not think that a tree moves, at least certainly not the way um, a chipmunk does, right? So the, the oak tree there, um, it pretty much is in my front yard now. And if I come back 50 years from now, it will be in my front yard again. But, you know, it's uh, uh, roots, are not in the same places where they were when it started. So they move in some kind of odd and interesting way, but it's very slow compared to the time scales uh, that say my chipmunk moves on. Uh, acorns, when they drop, they go someplace else besides where the oak tree was, okay? So, you know, we could argue about whether or not oak trees move. Some of us will be kind of feel uncomfortable saying they move. Some of us will be like, definitely, they clearly move. It's just not the way humans think of it. And others of us will be like, yeah, no way, dude, that's not right. Okay? Okay. Now, so movement, even in life forms here, maybe it's not enough of a distinction. But there are clearly things that aren't life that do move, okay? Like clouds right? You can go out right now and, uh, you know, set your uh, phone on time lapse and set it there on the sidewalk and let it just take pictures of the sky and you will see clouds moving by. Now clouds, uh, I think most of us agree, are not alive and they move. So clearly movement is not a singular distinguishing property that would let us identify an organism as being alive or not. Okay, well what about growing? Okay, well, oak trees definitely grow, right? They start as little acorns, they sprout into little oak saplings, they grow into medium oak trees, and then eventually into giant oak trees. That happens very slowly, but they do grow. They start small and they get big, okay? Chipmunks, clearly the same thing, right? They're little baby chipmunks, and then they you know, eat and get big and strong, and they run around, and then they grow into big chipmunks, okay? Okay, well, you know what? So do clouds, right? If you've ever watched a storm grow, you start with small clouds and they gather more moisture and it condenses out of the air and gathers and makes into a big giant thunderhead and becomes a cloud. Okay, so clearly growth isn't the distinguishing characteristic of life either. Okay? Um, what about reproduction? copying yourselves, right? Often that is an identifier we think about or we talk about life. So oak trees definitely reproduce, right? They grow little acorns, they're pollen, the uh, oak trees must pollinate. Actually, that's something I don't know. I don't know what the reproductive cycle that leads to an acorn is, but an acorn's kind of a seed, so there's gotta be a pollinization process. Uh, but yeah, so they reproduce, the acorns fall off, they roll off down the hill, and then they uh, you know, get grabbed by a squirrel and buried somewhere, and they grow up and become a new oak tree. Okay, so that's the reproductive cycle for an oak. Chipmunks, the same thing. Chipmunks are mammals, they bear live young, um, and so they also have growth, uh, uh, reproduction, okay? Well, you know what? So does fire, right? Fire clearly reproduces itself. If I have a uh, match and I want to make more fire, I can put it next to another match and it clearly reproduces itself. I can put it on a piece of paper and it clearly reproduces itself. Okay, so reproduction all by itself is not the only thing that we can use to identify life, okay? Well, let's say eating, right? 
We're all locked up during the pandemic right now. We're certainly uh, getting very chonky eating pizza and Easter candy. So eating and consuming energy is something we might decide is an identifying characteristic of life. Well, oak trees definitely do that. They harvest sunlight, right? They gather the sunlight in through their leaves. They go through the photosynthetic process. Um, and that is their, their process of eating, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, chipmunks clearly too. I told you earlier, they're out in my bird feeders all the time. Okay, so chipmunks go eat. Well, you know what? Fire eats too, right? Campfire, what do you do? You throw a piece of log on the fire or you throw charcoal in your, in your barbecue grill. That provides the chemical energy that, that, that uh, fuels the fire. Okay, so, so clearly even just eating and consuming is not enough for us to identify life. Okay, and so the same lessons we learned in our previous two examples still, uh, still uh, applies here, right? It's just not sophisticated enough to take that single property, that single behavior, and say that's going to be the thing that we can use to identify life. It's just not going to be enough because we can always find examples where uh, something that we clearly agree is not alive uh, exhibits that behavior. Okay, and because taxonomy can change and develop over time and it improves and becomes more complex with our data, that's going to be our saving grace here, right? The whole notion that we want to settle in on is that it's a combination of ideas are what we're going to need in order to define what we mean by the word life. Okay, and the important thing here is, is of any of the properties we might write down to define what life is, some of them are going to be necessary, but none of them by themselves is going to be sufficient to say that something is alive or not alive. And that's what the whole point in all of these three examples has been. Okay? Okay, so let's define kind of six basic criteria. And we've kind of talked and touched on a couple of these, but let's kind of be explicit about them. And these six basic criteria are the ones that we have kind of settled on as biologists, as chemists, as astrochemists, as astrobiologists, um, as astronomers, that they are the framework in which we're going to think about the identification of life. Okay, and as we start talking about our first searches for life that we've that we've made out into the uh, solar system in particular, um, we'll find that it's not as easy as we think it is. But nonetheless, this is the uh, basic framework that we've been using. Okay, so um, oops, uh, looks like they're going to appear out of order. Okay, so reproduction is one thing that we had talked about. Okay, so reproduction, living things make copies of themselves. Okay, they extend the uh, persistence of life beyond the lifetime of a single individual. Okay, now the fact that life uh, changes over time, that individuals change over time, they grow old, is an interesting problem in biology. Um, some life forms clearly age differently than others, and it's not a process that we necessarily understand. But the way natural systems, living systems, have overcome that uh, degenerative process of, of uh, evolving towards death um, is through reproduction, okay? And that's also how life propagates, okay? And so there are many examples of this. So there's a little Lego family there. Uh, and of course, baby Yoda proves that Master Yoda is in fact uh, uh, a, a life form, okay? Um, living things are never organized at random, okay? So uh, there's a pile of sand there, right? Sand grains don't show any kind of necessary pattern. They're just kind of a jumbled mess. But life forms themselves are very organized systems. They have structures. They have uh, uh, internal structure that gives them form, but they also have structures that carry along all the uh, life processes. Um, and it is that order, as we say, that enables all of the things that we call life processes, okay? Now, as in the spirit that we've been talking about, that's not a, a, a it's a necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition to define what life is. Um, sand is a perfect example. If you were to look closely at grains of sand, uh, individual grains of sand are glassy, um, and glass is a very ordered molecular substance, right? And so um, order is uh, certainly all around us, but so is disorder. And what we mean here when we say living things are not organized at random is we mean that the systems, the order that they have um, uh, imposed on themselves 
are part of the processes that uh, define what life is all about. Okay? Okay. So the third category we talked about is growth and development. So all living things that we've encountered on Earth seem to grow and change in some way. At some point in their life cycles, they're initially small and then they grow into something bigger, or they're initially one way and they grow and change into something different, okay? That's true in uh, every life system that we've seen uh, on Earth, okay? And so a classic example here is the maple tree. You got a little maple sapling there, and eventually it grows into a big maple tree, okay? Okay. Energy utilization, right? So clearly every life form that we uh, encounter uh, uses energy in some form. That's what the whole circle of life is all about. The plants harvest the sunlight and they use that energy to grow. Animals eat the plants to use that energy to grow and change. Animals eat the other animals. We all die. Our nutrients go back into the soil, which supplements the plants and in this big a large circle, okay? So living things use energy. So that means they have to harvest energy somehow. The planets, uh, the planets, the plants do it through sunlight. Animals do it through uh, eating plants or eating other animals, but they have to get the energy from somewhere, okay? And the thing they do with that energy is they carry out their life processes. They use it to grow, they use it to reproduce, they use it to move around, they do all the things that, that life does, okay? Okay. Um, living things respond to the environment around them, okay? So the example that I've shown here in the picture is in the fall, when the temperature around here in Chicago starts to go down, all of the trees start to go into their winter dormancy period. They uh, kind of retract all of their uh, uh, processes uh, out of the branches and the leaves and down into their core, into the roots. That causes the leaves to go from their green uh, photosynthesizing state into the beautiful fall colors that we see around here, okay? So they're responding to the fact that the days are getting shorter, the temperatures are getting cooler, and that triggers a response in the tree to change the way it's going about things, okay? Uh, there are other great examples of this. You and I are uh, on a diurnal cycle, so we sleep at night, most of us, for most of the time, but when the sun comes up, we get up, okay? There's a whole set of animals that do the exact opposite thing. They sleep during the day and they're nocturnal, but they get up at night, okay? So living things respond to uh, the environment around them, okay? Now, as we've said before, that's clearly not, uh, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? The lake there in that picture is going to change when the season changes. Uh, it's going to freeze when winter gets here, and it's going to thaw when summer gets here, okay? That is clearly not an indicator that the lake is alive. It's responding to the environment. But again, this is necessary but not sufficient to the definition of life, okay? And then lastly, there is so-called evolutionary adaptation. And so we're going to talk a lot about evolution uh, for a lecture on Wednesday. Um, this seems to be one of the key things about life that is uh, key to every living thing that we've seen and that we talk about when we identify on Earth. And that is, over time, uh, life forms fill ecological niches and they change their form to make them more suited to existing in the environment in which they live. Okay, and there's many reasons why they respond and change their form. And we'll talk about that when we talk about evolution. So this is one of my favorite examples uh, here in the picture here. This is called a leafy sea dragon. It's a kind of seahorse, but you see that its appendages, all of its spines and its tails and its flippers um, make it look very much like seaweed. And that's a defense mechanism that lets them uh, hide uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the water in the plant life. Okay, so that's an example, uh, that, that list of three, uh, that list of three things, that list of six things are all examples of things that are individually um, necessary. We think all six of them are necessary to identify something's life, but no single one of them is sufficient for us to call something life. And we can usually think of examples of things that aren't alive that obey any given one of these uh, 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 properties. Okay, but all of them we think are necessary. Now, that being said, let me give you a brain twister to go and think about that will make the statement I just made somewhat in question. 
okay? So I want you to consider an artificial intelligence. So consider a computer that has an artificial intelligence algorithm. So this is a neural network. So what the neural network does is it takes in data from the world around it, and then it changes the way it works, it learns, okay? And neural networks are usually designed to do very specific things. So for instance, uh, right now we use neural networks uh, artificial intelligence is when you go shopping at Amazon, it looks at what you've been looking at. So if I go looking for Star Trek uniforms, then the neural network that Amazon's using goes and figures out what sorts of things I like and what sorts of things I buy, and then shows me lots more of those things, okay? So they're designed to do something, okay? And those neural networks constantly rewrite themselves. They learn and they get better, just like you are doing when you're in college, okay? Now, what this computer does though is more sophisticated than that. It controls the heating system uh, that has chilling towers that keep it cool in the room where it works so that it can operate at peak efficiency. Um, and what it does is it's looking at different designs for computer chips. It decides how changes in those designs can make the computer run faster so it can learn faster. And when it figures out an improvement, it tells a robot to go make a new computer chip and build a new computer that it sets to this exact same task, okay? Thinking about how to make better computers and then building better computers, okay? So if you sit down and you think about this, go through our list of things that life must have uh, in order to uh, be considered alive, my question for you, is this computer system, is this artificial intelligence alive or not? Okay, and this is a classic example of where we find ourselves in the current era. And there's been a lot of science fiction written about this. Okay, this is not a new question, but I think it's good to think about in the context that you and I have been talking about our definition of life because we are going to face up against the question of are machines alive or not by any definition of the standard that we have for what life is. Okay, okay, so that's all I'm going to say about this. Okay. Uh, I hope you're all having a good time. Uh, I will see you in office hours. Um, otherwise, we'll put some more lectures up on Wednesday. Okay? Have fun, everyone. Take care.